Anyway, so I want to share some marriage uh, tips with you guys, and really it's just good relationship stuff in general. You know, since I know there's some of you here who are single, hope to get married, some of you who are single who want to remain that way, <laughs> some of you who are married, uh, <coughs> happily married, some of you who are married and wish you were single. No, just kidding. <coughs> I'm going to help you guys. But anyway, you'll get some stuff out of this this morning, and we'll have a lot of fun. So anyway, so this session is... How to stay married and not kill anyone. <clears throat> so when I heard that the series was relationship goals, I thought this, this is an, a good one. Yeah. If, if we don't kill anyone in there, I think that's a win. Yeah. All right. So what we're going to do, <clears throat> we're going to start off and I'm going to put you guys on a panel. Okay? And what this panel is, is we are going to roll back the clock some 4,000 years. And we are going to decide <clears throat> who is going to be the next mother of the next king of Israel. Okay, we're back at the time of David. And see, King David had five wives, all right? And one of these wives is going to become the mother of the next king of Israel, who's King Solomon, right? And eventually, she's going to go on to become the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. All right, so now we have to figure this out. So <clears throat> now you would think it might be wife number one, because she's got dibs, right? She's been around the longest. But we know it's not her, because David stopped sleeping with her which is easier to do when you got four more in the wings. Uh, all right? So you know it's not her. And you come down to the other end, you have uh, wife number five. Uh, her name is Bathsheba. Now, I don't know if you guys remember the story of Bathsheba, but she uh, was out one day uh, taking a bath. Clearly, this was before indoor plumbing. And uh, King David's walking around, and he goes, and he goes, holy cow, who that? He notices this, this lady. So he hooks it up so that he can meet her. He seduces her. He ends up sleeping with her, gets her pregnant, and then kills off her husband so he can marry her. Yeah, not exactly a holy union, okay? <laughs> In fact, if it wasn't because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder, uh, she wouldn't even be there, okay? So again, so we need to decide which one of these wives is going to be the next mother to the next king of Israel, King Solomon, eventually the great-great-grandmother Jesus. But... <clears throat> You think about that. We'll come back to that. All right? So if you are going to stay married for a lifetime, which is the goal here, number one, you have to avoid bitterness and resentment. Now, that might sound easy to do, but what happens is one person will begin to feel the weight of the relationship falling on them too much, and then they begin to get resentment towards the other person. All right? Now, the one who's bearing the weight is really a matter of perspective, right? Because men and women keep score very differently. If you've learned this, men are very quick to give ourselves huge bonus points for everything we do. We do. You know, for example, a man's day, here's how he would score his day. So a man gets up in the morning. For that, 500 points. <laughs> he goes off to work, works hard, provides for his family, brings financial stability into his family, and for that, 3,000 points. <laughs> he comes home, straight home. He doesn't go out to the bars, chase women or anything. He comes home faithfully. For that, he gives himself 1,500 points. <laughs> he comes home at the end of the day. He's got 4,500 points, and now it's your turn to catch up. I'm not saying it's right. But see, this is why a man can sit down and contribute absolutely nothing. Because see, in his mind, he's way up for points in the day. The, the problem is um, he, uh, his wife scores his same day just a little different. <laughs> All right? <laughs> now, uh, the way she would score this man's same day, she sees the man get up. She appreciates that. Well, you got up in the morning. Good job. <laughs> Ding. One point. She sees him go off to work. He works hard, provides for his family. She loves that about him. She appreciates that. So for that, she gives him, ding, <laughs> one point. <laughs> he comes home. He doesn't go out and chase other women, doesn't hit the bar. He comes straight home faithfully. She loves that about him. She appreciates it. For that, she gives him, ding, <laughs> one point. Now, she also got up. She also went to her job. She got the kids ready. She took them to piano lessons, cooked dinner. She did, she's got 13 points by the end of the day. Her mind, it's 13 to 3. 
and now you want to come home and contribute absolutely nothing? That's, of course, when she usually starts yelling, which found out is actually a good thing, because I think it's the quiet ones who really do kill people. <laughs> so as long as you can hear her, you're safe. She gets quiet. I'd get nervous. Honey, where are you? <laughs> All right. Now, now listen, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you know, especially the guys, they hear this and they get discouraged because they say, are you kidding me? No matter what I do, I get one lousy point. Yes. But there's good news in this, guys, okay? And I'm about to tell you what that is. It's, it's this. Any simple act of kindness earns the same as a big act of kindness. But men do not get this. So as a consequence, we don't pay attention to those things. See, in the world of men, little means jack squat. Right? It's all about who's the best. Who's in first place. Second place is just the first loser. Right? And this is just inside of men. And we care about the big thing. Let's go big. Let's go big. And it really starts from the time that we're in boys, you know, always competing. And I was telling everyone... Last night, hi, so I have uh, three boys and then a little girl, and the boys are always fighting about everything. I explained to them the underwear competition they got into yesterday. You can ask, ask them about that, but they're just constantly f- arguing about things. I'm better. I'm this. I'm that. And then we take that into the marriage. We want to do the big things, right? That's why men go all out only like four times a year. You got the birthday? You got the anniversary, you got Christmas, and then the obligatory Valentine's Day, <laughs> all right? And he'll go all out, he'll do something big, and he'll take it to the girl, and then he goes, that'll hold her. <laughs> but, but it does not hold her. In her mind, you've done four things all year, you bum, all right? <laughs> Now, listen, guys, there's good news in this, and it is this. It's that you are working too hard, all right? I'm about to show you how you can simplify. I'm about to show men how you can earn points by doing almost nothing. You know, guys do not get this. They don't. You know, uh, there's a guy, uh, Dr. John Gray. He's the one who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He's got this great analogy. He says, if a man brings a rose to a woman, she goes, ding, one point. Now, see, a man thinks one rose, one point, a dozen roses, 12 points. So he goes out, he spends a bunch of money, gets these beautiful long stem roses that I've heard last night that you guys clearly like to get roses for your wives. You hand those to her, she goes, oh, thank you so much. Ding! One point. Now listen, by, by, by a show of hands, how many ladies in this room would rather receive 12, one rose 12 different times than a dozen roses once? That freaks all the men out. That's so inefficient. And guys don't get this. You know, it's funny, we... Uh, we were doing a conference once, and this gal who, who works for me, uh, it was uh, her husband's first time coming to the seminar. So it comes to this point, and he sees all these women raise their hands, and you should have seen the look on this guy's face. Why? <laughs> so he goes, okay, I got an idea. So this gal, she comes into the office on Monday, and she goes, Phil, you will never Guess what my husband did. I can tell she's upset, so I want to hear the story. And I go, well, what did he do? She goes, okay, so you remember? I, I remember because I, I, I was there. <laughs> do you remember? So all those women raised their hands. and They'd rather receive, you know, one rose 12 different times. So, he's, so he thinks in his head. He knows a workaround around this. She's like, I come home yesterday and right there in the front lawn is a rose bush that was my response 
I'm like, that's awesome. It is not awesome. I walk into the house, and he goes, did you see the rose bush? She goes, yes. Well, now you can get yourself a rose anytime you want. <laughs> I said, that's awesome. It is not awesome. I'm like, no, no, no. It was dumb. He's going to have to pay for that. But that's awesome. That's awesome for me to hear that. Uh, like, I'm now going to tell that story every place that I go to. It's like, but listen, guys, she does not care about your efficiency. She cares about simple acts of kindness. But there's good news in this, guys. All right, I'm about to show you how you can win points with a woman by doing virtually nothing. Here is one. You wake up in the morning. You get out of bed. Turn around and make the bed. That takes all of what, 45, 60 seconds? And she'll look and she'll go, oh, ding! <laughs> one point. Here's another one. You know that monument of dirty underwear you have building on the floor. <laughs> this means something. <laughs> Here's an idea. Pick it up. Put it in the dirty laundry hamper. That takes, what, 15 seconds? And she'll go, oh, ding! <laughs> one point. Here's another one. How about when you finish eating dinner, instead of sloughing away to the couch like Jabba the Hutt? <laughs> Ooh, da -da -ba -da 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 -wookie. <laughs> How about you take the dirty dishes, put them in the sink? That takes what, 15, 20 seconds? Virtually nothing. And she'll go, oh, ding, one point. Now, listen, ladies, you know the reason that men don't care about things like such as our dirty underwear sitting on the floor? It's just because it doesn't mean much to us. It's not because we're evil, all right? The truth is most men could live like hamsters. <laughs> Wad up some paper here, eat there, poop there, we're good. <laughs> but guys, she is not a gerbil. All right, so pick it up. Now, guys, you want to learn how to earn some really easy points? You plan strategically to take the girl someplace really nice. And you say, oh, yeah, and I'll surprise her. No, you amateur. <laughs> what you do is you tell her. As soon as you tell her, ding, one point. And you've done almost nothing. Now, the great thing about this system is because she's a woman, she is going to tell all the other women in her life <laughs> about what you're about to do. And every time she tells one of her friends, <gasps> ding, one point, you, my friend, are literally doing nothing. <laughs> and the great thing about this is every time... She tells another woman, not only are you earning a point, but the poor slob of a husband who's married to her is losing a point. <laughs> That's a win-win. That's a net gain of two, okay? <laughs> and you're doing virtually nothing, all right? Man, I love it. Anyway, wanna, another way you can earn some very simple points, all right? And the easiest way a man can score points with a woman by doing virtually nothing is to simply engage the girl in meaningful conversation. Meaningful for her means you be quiet, she talks. <laughs> All right? But now you can't go off into your nothing box, which we learned about yesterday, okay? Because then she'll figure out, and then you're going to lose all your points, okay? So you got to pay attention and listen to her. And listen, do you know during the conversation that just every time you acknowledge what she said, you'll earn a point? She comes back, la, 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 la. Oh, really? La, 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 la? <gasps> Ding. <laughs> One point. La, 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 la,
really? So you're saying, la dee 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 doop dee doop? <laughs> Ding! <laughs> One point. <laughs> la la la! Dee 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 dee! Well, really? How did that make you feel? <laughs> ding, 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 ding! And you're doing nothing! Just every time you acknowledge her, simple acts of kindness, focus on the little things. Like I was telling everyone, Yesterday, I mean, that's how you got her to fall in love with you in the first place. She knows you're ugly. <laughs> how do you think you got such a cute girl? Simple acts of kindness. And don't worry, guys, we created something to help you. Oh, I forgot to grab one of the books. But I remember uh, my dad, when he did one of these first things, he thought, you know, we should come up with a book. This is 365 simple acts of kindness. Then he goes, no, it's for men. 52 simple acts of kindness. <laughs> Lower the bar there like he's going to do this every day. So anyway, so that was years ago. And I finally thought, you know, we need to do this book. So we got together, created this book, had our graphic designer illustrate this thing. It's just this little hardcover book. It's called 125, 152, I think we ended up at. We had to make the book at least more than 52. It was a pretty small book. <laughs> simple acts of kindness. And inside of that book are just simple things like vacuum. I know. It seems like a miracle if he gets a vacuum out. You know, uh, go see her, a movie with her that she wants to see. Uh, do the dishes. All these little things. And they're just simple things. And what's real funny is it got the book and it got all printed up. Uh, and it's funny. We slapped my dad's name on the front of it even though... He didn't actually write it. That's right. He uh, writes my paycheck, so that's fine to put his name on there. <laughs> Whatever you want. No, but uh, you go through there. So we're sitting there, and we're sitting there with some of the girls in the office. And uh, my sister-in-law works for us. She's actually married to one of my best friends. We knew each other since we were, like, in third grade. We married sisters. We were roommates at the time. We kind of joked around, like, ha-ha, you should date her sister. And then he did. <laughs> and then we all got married. We're like, that's legal, right? Like, I mean, we're in a... <laughs> Are you got one of the books? So anyway, so we get this book, and it's so funny. I'm sitting there, uh, uh, 125, sorry, um, going through that, and she's just looking at these things. And she started, you know, at number one, and she's like, nope, 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 no. Nope. And I'm talking. I kind of see her over there. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm just going through this, and so far he's not done one of these things. Uh-uh, <laughs> uh-uh. She got in on like number 17. Okay, he's done that. He's done that. I thought, oh, goodness. I'm like, yeah, my poor wife could probably go through quite a bit of these as well. So anyway, uh, 125 things, simple acts of kindness. Who's a man who needs some help? The dude in the soundboard, like, beat all you all. Uh, you're back at the soundboard. I'll give this to you, though, later. There you go, buddy. All right. <laughs> now, listen, it's the simple things. Guys, focus on the little things. Now, ladies... You know he is quick to give himself huge bonus points for everything he does. So what is a way a woman can earn huge bonus points with a man? Uh, we're in church, so I just I won't say it this morning, but <laughs> <laughs> assuming you cannot do that every five minutes, though, uh, <laughs> there, uh, there, are, there, are, there is another way, all right? And it is this. It is quite simply when you believe in the man. Now, this might sound like something easy to do, especially for all of you younger ones who haven't been married very long. It's just because you haven't heard all of the dumb things that he is going to come up with, okay? <laughs> but it's okay, all right? He's just venting. He's dreaming. He's thinking everything through. Just don't be quick to dismiss him, all right? You know, a lot of women do this. Some of you maybe have undoubtedly done this. You know, he goes and he explains something. You go, oh, that's just dumb. Oh, you never do that. Oh, I'd get so mad at you if you ever did that. Right? And then he gets quiet, and you think you fixed him, but you haven't fixed anything. 
See, all you've done at this point is taught him that he cannot share his dreams with you. Ouch. That is a very dangerous place to be. Because miraculously, at work, at church somewhere, some bimbo is going to come along, <laughs> hear one of his ideas, and go, oh, you'd be great at that. He goes, oh, really? And now you're in some serious trouble. Because, you know, most affairs do not start for sexual reasons. They start for emotional ones. All right? And so you don't want that. You don't want your husband to think he cannot share those things in you. You want your husband to know that you are his number one fan. All right? Because when a woman believes in a man, she gives him what he wants more than anything. Now, yesterday, if you were here, we ended with what women want more than anything. This morning, I'm going to tell you what men want more than anything. Because, see, what a man really wants more than anything is the admiration and respect of his wife. Which, by the way, one of the most respectful things a woman can do is to passionately make love to that boy. <clears throat> Seriously, man, those two things are tied very, very closely, okay? Okay. But listen, it's all about this idea of respect. You know, now, a, a lot of it, women will say, well, I'll respect him when he earns it. No, 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 no. See, respect is far too important for a man to be dependent upon his earning it. In fact, the key to unlocking great potential in any man is to begin respecting him before he earns it. See, women, women used to know this. You know, but our culture's gotten all messed up and twisted. You know, it's like men have kind of lost the art of how to be romance and lovers to their wives. And, and women have stopped giving their husbands any respect. Actually, look in culture. Look at any TV show, any movie in the family. Who's always the dumbest person in the family? The dad. He doesn't know anything. Everyone makes fun of him. It might make for a funny show. But you let that seep inside your head and you start playing out at it at home, you got to be careful. You know? Because you know who knows how to really give respect to a man before he's earned it? Is God. How many times does God come to some seeming loser and treat him with great respect, right? When Jesus first runs into Simon, he says, I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. God, he must have been a rock, man. That dude was more jello than rock when he first met him. <laughs> You know, but he starts to give him great respect, starts immediately treating him with respect, and it changes him. And Peter, it does go end to be the rock that the church was built out of. Love the counts of Abram, who becomes Abraham. You know, God comes to Abram, starts giving him all these promises. You ever wonder why? Well, because he was a man of great faith. He eventually, in the beginning, he was more of a man of paste and flour than he was faith and power. He, you know, this is because this is the same guy. If you remember this story, Abraham, he's got his, you know, wife, Sarah, and they they go in to the city, and the king sees his wife. He goes, Man, who's that? Oh, and he goes, Oh, uh, th this girl here? Oh, she, she's a uh, uh, she's my sister. You imagine the look you would give your husband if the president came in today. He goes, man, who's that really good-looking girl? Over there? Oh, that's, that's my sister. <laughs> you would give him the look, right? But he doesn't. Well, the king finds out, and he goes, what? Why did you, why'd you say it was your sister? Well, because I was afraid. He was afraid. He didn't have faith and power. What's well, crazy that it happened twice. <laughs> Clearly did not learn the first time. And think about it. I think the first time, was she like 60 years old? If you are 60 years old and the king of a great nation looks at you and goes, ho chi mama, you are a serious babe, okay? I'm just saying. I don't know who this woman was, but that is impressive. Good genes there, all right? He called him Abraham, you know, father, a multitude. Of course, it happened before he had any kids. It's one of the most respectful things you could say to a man in that culture. He'd walk into a city. What's your name? Abraham. Holy cow, man. How many kids you got? 
yeah, about that. <laughs> but eventually he goes on, treats him with respect. Eventually he does become a father of a great nation, right? Yeah. Think about the story of Gideon. Gideon starts off there. He's cowering in the basement because the Midianites are in town. They're kicking butt and taking names. So he's hiding out. And an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you are a mighty warrior. Uh, think you got the wrong basement. I'm more of what you would call a, a girly man, okay? No, you are a great warrior. <laughs> Gives him respect when he is at his lowest, Whoa. most cowardly place. And then that dude goes on to become a great A butt kicker. He does. He goes on to win one of the most lopsided military victories in humankind. Wow. You guys remember the, the movie 300? Yeah. All the guys like, yes, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta admit, every time you see it on the TV and it's like the battle scene, you stop for a sec. Like, like, oh, that's awesome. Anyway, it was about these 300 guys who stand up against, you know, these forces and they win some amazing battles, but at the end, they all die. You know that Gideon takes 300 guys, goes on and takes out an army. He lost zero, not a single casualty. That's some serious butt kick in there. Right? All from a man who was a coward, a shell of a man. See, that is the power when you start to treat a man with great respect before he earns it. See, again, women used to know this. You know, people used to say the key to a great man is a woman who believes in him. Right? It's like a story of this, you know, this lady and she's in college and there's these two guys pursuing her. She has to decide which one, and so she chooses this one guy, and she marries him, and, and he goes on to become mayor of the city. And then they come back for a reunion, and the other guy she didn't pick comes up to her and goes, well, I guess you picked the right guy, huh? She goes, well, why would you say that? Well, look at him, man. He went on to become mayor of the city. She looks at him, and she goes, oh, no, no, dear. If I'd have married you, you'd have become mayor of the city. Such is the power of a woman who believes in a man. So number one, you have to avoid bitterness and resentment. And number two, you have to keep the reset button handy. You know, what is that? Well, when I was young, uh, you know, they just started coming out with video games. You guys, how many of you remember Atari's? Yeah, some. I got to look at the guys that are slightly older than all the people that have been up here so far. They're like, oh, yeah, real old, like Nintendo 64? <laughs> no, no. I was like out of high school when that came out. <laughs> I'm talking about back in the day, you had the Ataris and the ColecoVisions and all these things. And so my dad loved these. And so he would get these video games and he'd sit and play these video games. Of course, like any young boy, I'm drawn to that like a moth to a flame, right? And so I would come and I would watch it. I'm like, that's so cool. And he'd go, sure, uh, you want to play? Yeah, I want to play. Okay. And he'd hand me the controller and then kind of forget to plug it in. And <laughs> so we'd go and play. And it dawns on me at one point, like, wait a second. This isn't working. <laughs> oh, sorry, son. Uh, no, it came unplugged. There we go. You know, so finally I got to the point, okay, we're playing. Now, of course, I'm a little kid, you know, so my dad's much better than me, so he would always keep the score pretty close. You know, he'd kind of let me catch up, and then he'd kind of come back and make it close, let me get up there, and then he'd come back, you know, because he's enjoying the parody of having the close game. Well, that's what's going on in his head. In my mind, I'm like, clearly the goal of this is to crush your opponent. <laughs> so while he is off at work, I am at home honing my craft, <laughs> and I am working, and I'm getting good, and all of a sudden, I start to beat him. It's still kind of close at first, but then I start to crush him, 
and now while when he was playing against me and he was better than I am, you know, he had, you know, mercy on me and he would let me stay close. I had no such mercy. <laughs> I would crush him and the more gloriously I crushed him, the better I felt. <laughs> and he would get so frustrated. He would go and I'd be going and I'd get way ahead in the points and then he'd reach over and go, beep, and he'd hit the reset button. Hey, sorry, my finger slipped. Let's do it again. <laughs> we'd go, we'd go, and I'd get up on points, and he'd go, bleep, hey, knock it off. <laughs> that reset button became my dad's favorite button, all right, because no matter how high the points got, no matter how out of whack they got, he could hit the reset button, and it would go back to zero. Would it not be wonderful if God gave us reset buttons, do you know that he has given us such a button? That despite how messed up the scores got, you could reach over and go, bleep. Now, my parents, when they got married young, like 18, 19 years old, and they got married, and then they recently just got saved at 16. You know, they were like dope-smoking hippies. Not like, they literally were dope-smoking hippies. <laughs> and uh, they, they got saved, and uh, they went on the mission field because they just wanted to do something for God. So they joined this other group of hippies for Jesus now. And seriously, you find old photos. My dad's got like this afro out to here, you know, and my mom with the long straight hair, you know. And they went and they joined this thing of the Jesus people, the Jesus movement. And they went around, toured all over, uh, all over the world. Um, actually went into Russia once, you know, uh, which he's got this funny story. So they, they were this, uh, a band, okay? And they were kind of like the American Christian rock band, which was a big thing over in Europe at the time. And so they'd go and they'd start playing music and then people would come and then they'd minister to them, okay? So anyway, so they're going in on this bus into Russia and they're, uh, they've got Bibles and stuff kind of in the bus. And, you know, of course, this is back Soviet Union, they come in and they're checking it. And obviously, they did not want Bibles in there, people handing out Bibles. And so they were a little nervous. And of course, <laughs> everyone in the band, you know, someone goes, uh, just act natural, which, of course, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, that's about as natural as they can act. So my dad thinks, okay, I got I to gotta liven things up a little bit. So he, he played the banjo. He had like three songs he could play. So he got out the banjo, and he starts playing this banjo song. And he's just trying to like make everyone look like, no, we're just sitting around playing the banjo. Nothing going on here. So the... <laughs> The Russian soldier, he comes on, and he takes a look, and he stands there, and of course, everyone's real nervous, my dad's just playing, and then he, the soldier just starts going. <laughs> he dances down one side of the bus, back down the other, jumps off, and away they went. It's like, thank you, Lord. So, anyway, they toured all over there, like my sister was born in Sweden, and stuff, and uh, they came back to the States, and they did stuff for a while, and Again, they would do these tent revival meetings, okay? So they went to Phoenix, Arizona. And this was before, before Phoenix was, you know, a huge city. It was just kind of uh, growing. And they went there. They set up their tent. And what they would do during the day is they would go out and they would pass out tracks, inviting them to the tent meeting, okay? Any of you real old folks really remember those tent meetings back in the day. And um, so they were doing that. So anyway, so there was this new thing that my dad and his buddies had never seen before. It was called a porno shop. And... They thought, well, let's set up here and hand out tracks. So they're like, okay. So they're setting up, and they're handing tracks to these guys as they're coming in. And, of course, these guys, you know, they would take the track, and then they'd read about and then they'd look up and go, oh, this isn't J.C. Penny. What am I doing here, you know? And they'd go around the other way. And my dad and his buddies were like, this is awesome. And so they just kept doing that and just watching these guys take the track about Jesus and, like, do these U-turns. And... So now, the thing is, is there was no, like, end date to when they did tent revival meetings. They just went there, and it was just until the evangelist, you know, the Lord told them to move on. So this is going on, you know, days, weeks that they're there. And listen, while my dad and his buddies are having a great time, the guy who owns the porno shop, not so much fun. And there's no end date. So he doesn't know if these guys are ever going to leave. So... When people get into desperate situations, desperate people do desperate things. So this guy goes and hires a hitman. 
And he tells us, hitman, I want you to go and I want you to kill that evangelist. Because if you kill that evangelist, then they'll finally leave. The killer goes, okay. So he goes into the tent meeting. And now the way these tent meetings worked is in the, in the very beginning, the evangelist would come out and he would welcome everyone, okay? And then uh, after that, then the band would play. So the, the thought was, right when the guy comes out to, in the beginning to welcome everyone, the guy was going to shoot the evangelist and then take off in the confusion. So anyway, so they come in. And this day, uh, my dad says, I'll never forget it. Uh, he said, the evangelist came to the band and said, man, I, I don't know. I'm just not feeling very well. You just guys go ahead and start playing, you know, uh, without me. And I'll, I'll come out in a little bit. So they go, okay. So the band goes out there, and they start playing, you know, old gospel hymns. And um, <laughs> they uh, are sitting there playing. So now this killer is stuck in this revival meeting. <laughs> right? Because he, <laughs> he's got to wait <laughs> till the evangelist comes out. Okay? <laughs> and so uh, they're just singing a song, you know, give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. And they jazz it up, and they're kind of playing. And then the lead singer goes, hold on. This next verse we're going to sing makes me love everybody. And when we sing makes me love everybody, I want you to go find someone. I want you to give them a hug. <laughs> and so they start singing, makes me love everybody. And so now he's getting up, and this killer's getting accosted by, like, old grannies giving him hugs. Oh, we love you, brother, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so after the music, all of a sudden the advantage starts feeling better. He comes out. Well, now the killer, he's just shell-shocked. He's just sitting there. And now he listens to the evangelist tell the story about how God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die on the cross and that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. And he hears this. And then at the end, you know, they do the altar call. The killer comes up to the front. And he falls on his knees. The counselor comes over, and the killer goes, I can't do it. I can't do it. The counselor says, yes, you can. <laughs> In fact, God wants you to do it. He says, no, no, and he pulls out the gun. <laughs> and that's how they found out about the story. <sighs> now listen, you may not hire a hitman, at least I hope you do not. <laughs> but the truth is that when somebody hurts us, we want to get back at them. We want them to pay. And the way that we make them pay is we tell them, I will never forgive you. See, the problem is the only one that that hurts is the person who won't forgive. See, unforgiveness is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. <laughs> the only one that hurts is the one who won't forgive. You might say, well, that's all good and fine, Phil, but you don't know what she did to me. You don't know what he did to me. I tried to forgive. I can't. Sure you can you just don't understand what forgiveness is. See, forgiveness is an act. It is not an emotion. It is not an erasure of your memory. You might feel the hurt of what that person did for a long time. It doesn't matter. You will remember what that person did. That doesn't matter. That's not what forgiveness is based on. I think, think about it, especially as Christians. And the Bible says we need to forgive. If we don't forgive others, he won't forgive us. Kind of a big deal. And think about it, you know. When Jesus forgives, says he forgets it, you know, it's like as far as the east is from the west. Now, I get what that's saying, but do you think that God honestly can't remember Something about you I can't stand, but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> no, he chooses to forgive you. Right. Okay? Right. 
Forgiveness is something you do. It is not an emotion. It is not an erasure of your memory. See, forgiveness is very simply when you say to someone, I forgive you. I will never use it against you in the future. I will never speak of it again. See, you can't control what you feel. You can't control what you can remember. You can, however, control what you say. And if there's a one telltale sign of a person who can't forgive, it's they never stop talking about it. Because see, forgiveness has more to do with your tongue than it does with your heart. I'm sure you've heard people, you know, who just can't forgive and they're always just, oh, I remember this. I remember that. I remember what you did 37 years ago. And they hang on to this stuff. And you're constantly reminding each other, oh, you did this. Shh, stop. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> just let it go. Okay. So here we go. Who did you guys decide on? Well, God steps in. He goes, you know what? I've already made my decision. Say, really, God, which one? He says, I pick number five. Really? You mean Bathsheba? You mean the one that's there? And the only reason she's there is because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder? And if you read your Bible, you'll find out that it is, in fact, Bathsheba who becomes the mother of Solomon, king of Israel the wisest man to ever live. Eventually goes on to become the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus himself. So you could make the argument that had it not been for lust, lying, adultery, and murder, that Solomon would have never been born. You could make the argument that would have not been for lust, lying, adultery, and murder, that Jesus would have never been born. In fact, you know, you read the New Testament, and you, you, you start in in Matthew, and they start naming through the genealogy. You know that when it comes to her, they can't call her by name. They call her the wife of Uriah. That's the dude that David had killed off. It so didn't make sense to them. It's like this weird, bizarre aberration. You know, people say, oh, well, then praise God that happened. No, 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 no. That was never supposed to happen. Yeah. Well, well, now you're not making any sense. That's the point. See, no matter how much... You mess up. God is able to take your greatest mistake, your worst disaster, your biggest failure in your life and turn it into something so beautiful it won't make sense to anybody. So listen, you guys have just got to, you got to let that stuff go. You know, when I, I meet young couples... And they say, so what's, if you give us one, one good step of advice. So, you know, one of the things is learn to forgive quick. Yeah. Forgiveness is like getting a sliver in your finger. Mm-hmm. And it's owie. And we don't like to touch the owie. And you have little kids that get a sliver in their finger, mm-hmm. try and pull that thing out. You're not quite sure if I'm trying to pull out a sliver, I'm trying to chop off their entire arm. <laughs> I haven't touched it yet. No! <laughs> but why do we torture our children to get that out? Because if it stays in, it can get infected. And it can lose your arm. It can kill you all from a little sliver. Yes. This is unforgiveness. Yeah. I get it's owie. I get you still feel that. But start to learn to pull that thing out. All right? Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel, and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.